Good morning. My name is Michael Gilch. Uh, since it's Halloween, uh, we thought we'd bring in a sort of longer haired person to fill in for Marcus. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Thank you. A little late. Uh, a couple things before we start here. Welcome to the uh, Unitarian Universalist congregation at Montclair. Uh, we ask that you silence your cell phones, put them in worship mode, uh, and please take them off the Wi Fi if they are on the Wi Fi. We have enough technical difficulties as it, as it is, uh, and it helps unladen our Wi-Fi, as it were. Uh, our uh, COVID reopening guidelines ask that you do not join us in song. You hum, whistle, <laughs> no, don't whistle, hum uh, to yourself um, and take in the experience of our hymn leaders up here leading us in song this week. We have Ray and Jen. We have Glenn on vocals and guitar. We've got the Rev Scott on drums. Uh, and we ask that you stand and join us in your own way in the song with number 345, we claim, with joy we claim the growing light. One, two, three, four, and... Please join us in uh, number 1018, Come and Go With Me. And I want to... Yeah. 
Welcome. I'm so pleased on this Halloween day to see all this great group of Unitarians. A hundred percent of you have costumed up and are wearing masks. That is awesome. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your age, ability, history, identity, gender, or sexual orientation, you are welcome to bring your full self here. My name is Dan Silver. My pronouns are he, him, his. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. Today's service is a meditation on ancient art an invitation to discover the wisdom of the ancestors and perhaps to use that wisdom to shape our contemporary lives. Joining us to offer pastoral support from our pastoral care team for our virtual service is Judith. Judith will introduce herself in the chat. Please reach out if you want to contact her. For our in-person service, Marcia is here from our pastoral care team. Marsha is in the back now waving to us and wearing a gold stole. Please read out to, reach out to Marsha for pastoral support and connection. Our COVID protocols include social distancing and we will be masked and as possible vaxxed. We welcome all and realize that there is not a vaccine available for children under 12, so we have established a space in our sanctuary for families with young children. And we have restricted congregational singing, asking instead that we hum along with our hymn leaders. Connection Cafe follows our service virtually via Zoom and on a multi-platform today from the Pearls Room at 11.30. Please see your This Week at UUCM Bulletin for other important information. And now we welcome Reverend Anya for our Covenant Group facilitator installation. Thanks so much, Dan. So today we install our covenant group facilitators, these dedicated leaders trained in small group facilitation, maintain a ministry to us, to our members, to our community. A covenant group is part of the congregation's connection ministry. It provides a structure within which mutual ministry can thrive. It encourages people in their spiritual growth and helps them develop relationships of substance and depth. Group members listen to each other, but do not attempt to fix each other. Hallelujah for that. Covenant groups are a sacrament of right relationships among the members and between the group and our congregation. Good morning. I'm Claudia Sanders, she, her, hers, our covenant group program coordinator and one of our Soul Matters groups facilitators and the drop-in covenant group. I'll read the names of our covenant group leaders. When I do, I welcome them to stand here on the chancel or if they are joining us virtually, to announce their presence into the chat. Ginny Crooks, Nick Lewis, Shirley Matthews, Carol McGough, Nelia Sellers, Dan Silver, and Laura Wilson. <laughs> Will you, Covenant Group facilitators, provide groups within which mutual ministry can thrive? Will you encourage people in their spiritual growth and help them develop relationships of substance and depth? Will you sustain our groups, which are themselves a sacrament of right relationship among the members and between the group and our congregation? If you will, please say, we will. We will. Congregation, hearing this commitment, will you honor these leaders with your words and celebration of praise? Thank you.
<laughs> Ours is a covenantal community. When we come together, it is understood that while we may not necessarily share common beliefs, we do share a common covenant, a commitment to come together in service to the beloved community. Let's light our chalice as our chalice lighting affirmation is shared. Let us open our senses to take in the beauty. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. I'm Reverend Anya Sandler Michael, she, her, hers, and this is our time for all ages. A story borrowed from Barbara Ehrenreich's 2019 article, Art Lessons from Our Cave Dwelling Ancestors. In 1940, four teenage boys stumbled almost literally from German-occupied France into the Paleolithic age. As the story goes, they had been taking a walk in the woods near the town of Montagnac when the dog accompanying them suddenly disappeared. A quick search revealed that their animal companion had fallen into a hole in the ground, so the boys made the perilous 50-foot descent down to find it. So today, we journey with them to see what they saw. And what did they see? They found the dog and much more, especially on return visits illuminated with paraffin lamps, the hole led to a cave, the walls and ceilings of which were covered with brightly colored paintings of animals unknown to the 20th century. Bison, oryx, and lions. <laughs> One of the boys who witnessed what we just saw and more reported that stunned and elated, they began to dart around the cave like a band of savages doing a war dance. Another said that the painted animals seemed to be moving. We were completely crazy, yet another said, although 
the buildup of carbon dioxide in a poorly ventilated cave may have had something to do with that. This was the famous Lasso Cave. Today, almost a century later, we know that that cave is part of a global phenomenon originally re referred to as decorated caves. They've been found on almost every continent. Imagine the ancestors that painted these wonders. Imagine the choice they made to make art like this manifest for their and every generation that would come. Standing stones illuminating their life and our shared journey. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Reverend Scott Samler Michael, he, him, his, and it's my honor to lead us in remembrances and prayer today. We're called to find depth in our days, discover reverence in this hour, and so we seek gentle meditations, a focused reflection, and ardent prayer, each as we are called yet mystically all together. And we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the requests and remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. Helen Buckley lights this candle and shares this for her husband, Jack. A year has passed since you have been gone, but time cannot eradicate the joy and love you brought to those around you. Rest in joyous peace, dear one, and know that you are missed by family and friends. And Tripp lights a candle for all of our ancestors here on Samhain, the Celtic holiday that we now call Halloween. There is an altar to ancestors in the back of the sanctuary. Please regard it on your way. David Lewis lights this candle for his wife, Carolyn Burr, who died one year ago yesterday. David shares, Carolyn was mater familia, not only to her own children, but to mine as well. She was my partner, my love. She left the world in a better place for all of her gifts and contributions. She is missed by many. Maggie Wells, lights this candle for her dear friend, John San Giorgio, who has been moved to rehab and is living on a ventilator. Please hold John in your thoughts and prayers. We light a candle for Arlene Marin, who suffered a fall and some challenging bruising. She'll be fine, but she's in pain. We light this for her health and healing. Catherine Council lights a candle for Carolyn Dilger, who had a mini stroke on Friday night. Carolyn is doing all right, but in the hospital awaiting results. Please send prayers. Dion Ford lights a candle of sorrow for her friend, Pari Burke, who died of cancer on October 16th. Pari was 48 and leaves behind a husband, mother, sister, and two children. She was a beautiful and funny person, and Dion will miss her. Dion also lights a candle of celebration for her parents, Reverend Joseph and Betty Ford, who celebrated 67 years of marriage on October 26th. You can clap for that. Um, and we light this final candle for the joys and sorrows that are deeply felt in our hearts, yet remain unspoken. May we hold this silence 
as this silence holds us. May our listening bring forth acts of love. I invite you to breathe deeply but gently with me to get comfortable in your seats and join me as we enter into the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life known in so many ways by so many names. Gracious power of love ever unfolding known by no single name completely. We gather together this autumn morning, praising community and nature, both of whose bounty we share. We gather in a time of uncertainty with hope dancing on our horizon, promising a potential end to the disruption of a pandemic that has altered so much of our lives. We gather knowing that no matter what bright and intelligent words we may utter, that if we have not love in our hearts, all we do will be in vain. We ponder together a different way of expressing ourselves, gathering here, welcoming all seekers after truth and beauty and justice and compassion. We gather in hopes of seeing more opportunities to share our truth and insight, our pain and sorrow, our joy and our triumph. And as always, our prayers go to the sad, the frightened, the hunted, the oppressed, the hungry, the homeless, we, we pray especially for those under the boot of oppression, those in our cities who struggle for peace both from crime and from systemic racism. We keep in our hearts those on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay where there was flooding over the weekend. And in all of our comings and goings, we pray that we remember that the Hebrew scriptures, the life of Jesus, the lessons of all the world's great religions require us to place before us always concern for those who suffer wherever they live, whether it's us, those near us, or those around the globe. Holy, loving power, grant us strength Strength to be rocks, stones standing strong to support the true, the weak, and the weary. In the name of all that each of us deems holy within, we pray. Amen.
We stand. We stand with and by one another. 80% of what you offer will care for our congregation, and 20% will support our October and November recipient, Perinatal Equity Foundation. The Perinatal Health Equity Initiative eliminates health care disparities in black infant and maternal health. Founded by Dr. Nastasia Davis, this nonprofit empowers black and brown women and their children in Essex County and New Jersey. Perinatal Health Equity Initiative also participates in advocacy, education, and research to further their work encompassing justice, equity, and compassion. For today's offering, you can text your UCM plate and your amount to 73256 to give. Mail us a check with Perinatal Equity Foundation in the memo, or simply place your gift in the offertory offering baskets. Ushers, please come forward. All of your gifts are worthy, and they are all received with love. Thank you. For today's reading, in the same essay that brought us our time for all ages, The Humanoid Stain, Barbara Ehrenreich studies the Paleolithic cave paintings of Lascaux, France, and ponders the discrepancy between the way animals and humans are rendered by Paleolithic artists. She writes as follows. There are human-like creatures, or what some archeologists call humanoids, referring to the bipedal stick figures that can sometimes be found on the margins of the panels containing animal shapes. The non-human animals are painted with almost supernatural attention to facial and muscular detail, but the humanoids have no faces. This struck me with unexpected force, no doubt because of my own particular historical situation almost 20,000 years after the creation of the cave art in question. In about 2002, we had entered the age of selfies, in which everyone seemed fascinated by their electronic portraits. On top of this, we have been served with an eviction notice from our own planet. The polar regions are turning into meltwater. The residents of the Southern Hemisphere are pouring northward to climates more hospitable to crops. I found myself exhilarated by our comparatively ego-free ancestors who went to great lengths and depths to create some of the world's most breathtaking art and didn't even bother to sign their names. And now from the oldest Hindu religious text, the R.G. Veda, a quote about the nature of reality. With words, priests and poets make into many the hidden reality which is one. Ooh. 
said we'd walk together. Ooh. Baby, come what may. Ooh. Back come the twilight. Ooh. Should we lose our way? Ooh. If as we're walking, a hand should slip free. Ooh. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Should I fall behind? Wait. so lovely to feel a congregation, to feel a people coming together in a space with one another, full bodies. Imagine that. <laughs> I keep finding myself struck today just by the beauty of everyone. We humans, especially now, especially here, we are nothing if not a giant matrix of contradictions. We are emerging from a time of isolation, but most of us, because of our relative wealth and access to technology, Zoom rooms and the sort, 
are more connected than ever? Forced inside, we devised elaborate Thanksgiving and birthday dinners where our screens connected us to friends and relatives fathoms away across the globe. And while 20 years ago, we would have only had the capacity to circle the globe with our voices, ringing through phone lines, now our faces are able to make the trek. It's funny when you think about it that way, giant faces sprinting around the globe on spindly little legs. That's the way we've been moving in this technology time. These mugs shining on computer screens in London and Auckland and Freetown, Sierra Leone. I was on a Zoom call the other day forging a community justice alliance and one of the participants noticing that another one of the participants was holding someone in their arms demanded, Katrina, raise that baby. A plea to view the face of the child. What is it about faces? When Reverend Scott and I, who's now in the technology loft up there, when we first started doing our virtual worship, before we advanced our technology, we were using our own computer cameras. That meant that as we were recording, our faces were right there staring back at us. Yes. And we soon realized that if Reverend Scott was staring at his own visage, he would be powerless to stop making faces, funny faces, serious faces, every kind of face, when we were supposed to be leading worship. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now our worship services are blasting our faces from here to western New Jersey. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> And we're going to Florida. Hi, Vince. And on occasion, our faces are going all the way to Poland when some adventurous Unitarians from the Warsaw Fellowship tune in. In the early 1950s, the powerful Unitarian minister A. Powell Davies' congregation in Washington, D.C. was overcrowded with seekers determined to hear his passionate sermons on the intersection of religion and politics. To satisfy their interest and to spread the Unitarian message, Davies set up satellite congregations all around the D.C. suburbs. The message was then projected by phone line to all of these satellites where congregants gathered around a single speaker to hear the word. Can you imagine remote worship like that? Just listening, listening in, without faces. Only a single speaker and a room full of people. We've grown so accustomed to the projection of these mugs. Can you remember the first selfie that you ever took? It's a long way back. I can remember the first selfie that we ever took. We were traveling across the country and it felt like a liberatory experience, <laughs> joyful that we could capture the two of us and the landscape and we didn't need to ask for any help. But now that selfies are everywhere and now that we have learned how tempting it is to use only those photos where we appear happy and where we look our best, where we project our personhood on the internet, on that book of faces. And when we have experienced the exhaustion of seeing our mugs right there looking back at us from Zoom rooms, perhaps, just perhaps, now that our faces are representing us everywhere and still only representing a fraction of our wholeness, we are learning the limits of our pixelated selves, the limits of our faces as representation 
of our beings. And when we are faced with a society grown interminably divided, a society that seemingly knows nothing of the wisdom of the Urg Veda that Dan read, that we are essentially and awesomely one, one, connected, a society that refuses to embrace the collectivist ethic that could save it, that could save us from the peril of a disease that has stolen millions of our people, a society that elected a narcissist, a narcissist that for a long time refused to cover his face, sparking a partisan divide where there should have been a cooperative collective defense of our most vulnerable populations. When we are faced with this contemporary reality, do we discover the limits of our individual faces? Or perhaps can we discover the ways that they fool us into thinking they contain the whole of our humanity? in their individual contours. The very word facade, with the same root as face, makes this point. Perhaps we have, like the mythic Narcissus, fallen in love with our own image, or at least the well-curated version of it and interpreted the face as the totality, as the best representation of ourself. There's a photo, not really a selfie, that I took of a circle of dear ones, my aunt who has since died, my mom and my dad. The photo is our feet in a circle touching toes. We're standing on the sand floor of a synagogue in Curaçao. When I look at the image, I feel it. The Jewish people who carved a home there, who accepted a sand floor as the ground of their temple, they struggled together to build something of worth amidst prejudice and rejection. So too, my blended family, Jewish and Catholic and Unitarian Universalist, I look at that photo and I can feel us walking the distance for one another, touching toes, our collective committing to the journey with one another. We're nothing if not contradictions. I have a thousand photos of our faces, but that is the only one the one of our feet touching that brings me to tears. It's much like what I love of the hands painted on the contours of the caves. The human hands. Our ancient ancestors took pains to paint the animals in a detailed and emotive manner. They didn't sign their names or add their faces, but they did often add their hands, glorious hands and ochre paint, often touching or reaching for other hands on the stone walls of the caves. Why did they do this? Perhaps, perhaps, and this perhaps is backed up by the scholarship of the author of our reading, Barbara Ehrenreich, and others before, perhaps they painted those hands on those walls to show that the work of creating those paintings was not an individual effort. Not a solo artist, but a whole community, wide and deep. The effort took time and it took a crowd, people to haul logs, to construct the scaffolding, people to bring the food, the water, and to prepare the meals, people to find the perturbances of rock that suggested the shapes of the megafauna, the giant animals. Analysis of the hand shows that there are those of all genders that participated and all ages. The art, the art had a function beyond preserving information about the megafauna that th thrived at those times, and it wasn't what had been suggested by some now outdated scholarship that it had a magic purpose. 
to attract those animals so that they could be used as food. Those weren't the animals that the faceless people ate. Unless, of course, a lion killed one and left a bit of meat for the humans to find, again, a collective effort. But they certainly weren't trying to lure animals into the cave. It wasn't about magic. If the cave art had a function, it was to engage the people in a cooperative act that was creative, which to me sounds a whole lot like worship. And what is even more powerful is it that these paintings were painted over and over again. The boys who first found the cave thought that the images on the walls were moving, were dancing around them. That's because there were many layers of paint applied for each one, applied when new communities came to find respite in the art in the cave, generation after generation. The walls weren't so much a gallery, they were an art school, a space to teach the power of collective work community after community, generation after generation, painting over the same animals to learn how to do that art. We are nothing if not contradictions. It strikes me that it's Halloween and I haven't yet talked about our embedded reaction of horror to a story about faceless people. The humanoids on the cave walls were faceless, as we heard in our reading. What one of the most frightening, scary movie memes, at least it has been for me over the years, is the faceless human. The camera pans into a dark room and you see the back of a person's head, and the camera gets closer and closer, and then the person whips around, and you see that they have no face, right? Does this terrify anybody else out there? <laughs> this, is the, this is the worst one for me. Why is this so terrifying? This is one of those horror movie memes that hits us in the existential funny bone. <laughs> there is an existential fear that we will be stripped of our individuality. That we who are essentially, sorry, wrong line there, that who we are essentially will be stolen from us. And every existential fear has grounding, has truth in a lived reality. Think about the fascist reality, a political reality of domination where a powerful few decide the fate of the many, the privileged and the discarded twisting their lives into the confines of a sick and repressive ideal, where the human beings become pawns in someone else's idea of good living, where their individuality no longer matters. A reality that was sickly and tragically sweeping our globe when the cave of Lascaux was discovered. Isn't it interesting? I mean terrifying. <laughs> And doesn't it add another layer, a parable perhaps, to the investigation of the Lascaux cave that shortly after its discovery, the one Jewish boy of the four was sent along with his parents to a detention center that served as a stop on the way to Buchenwald. A death sentence for many, a fascist death sentence. Miraculously, though, he was rescued by the French Red Cross. So he, this one soul, emerged from the threat of a fascist extermination as perhaps the only person on earth at that time who witnessed both the absolute hell of 20th century fascism 
and the artistic spirit of the Paleolithic age, the only person on earth. The horror and the salvation of his miraculous life speaks with absolute certainty that what is horror is not, is not at all the faceless humanoids on the cave walls, but the coercion of the many by the powerful few, replacing cooperation among equals. Horror is not being so vested in community that you allow your art to go unsigned, save handprints that speak of the collective. Horror is the progression of a society over time to stratification, then classes, then war, then the narcissistic turn to sacrifice many for the benefit of some. What is really scary, let me say it again, what is really scary is the coercion by the powerful that that replaced cooperation among equals. That's what's really scary on this Halloween morn. Perhaps there is reason to elevate the values of our long, long back ancestors a people that knew they needed one another to survive? Perhaps there is a reason to emulate them and not, and not sign our own names to the work that we know took collaboration and collective action, even if we are the one who could take credit for it. Perhaps there's a reason to remember the shoulders we stand upon and the benefits we gain because of those heights. Let me say it more simply. We are able to do every single thing that we are able to do because of every relationship that has shaped and sustained us. I am because you are because we are. That is the good word. That is the truth. We are able to breathe because our neighbor wears a mask. We are able to do what we do because of those who taught us. We are able to communicate because there is a language that others speak with words, with signs, with emotion. Exactly. So let us take a moment to remember the collective and the collaboration that is our life, a moment to ground ourselves not in our individual struggle, but in our collective call to preserve what truly saves, to preserve our communal interconnected world. So please offer a thank you by whatever word you choose or silently. It might be just simply thank you or hallelujah or bless you, or amen. Let the collective gratitude rise. Thank you, amen, blessed be. Will you reflect with me? What can the artwork of our most ancient ancestors teach us about today? song, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire.
need. By this we worship and are freed. Go in peace, in love, and in a collective spirit of community and collaboration. Amen. team who two minutes before the service lost the computer and then got it back up and running again. Congratulations. Please join us as you will outside on the lawn. It's a beautiful day and we'll be able to converse out there.